Thank you for joining us today. Art Basel, Miami Beach, Salon Talks. This one is called The Ethics of Art Advising. I'm gonna introduce Sarah Douglas and take it away. Thanks, Mary. Um, so thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I'm Sarah Douglas, I'm the editor of Art News Magazine. And I will just provide, before we start, um, some brief introductions of our panelists here. Um, so starting from the far right, we have, sorry, I'm pulling up my little document here. We have, <laughs> exactly. Well, I wrote these, so I'm kind of proud that I have this prepared here. Mary Sabatino has been with Gallery Lelong in New York since 1990, I believe, when the gallery was on 57th Street, and she became a director there um, just out of grad school. Uh, since 2005, she's been vice president and partner at the gallery, and she works with artists including Yoko Ono, Andy Goldsworthy, Ursula von Riddingsvard, Etel Adnan, and many others. Uh, next to her is Joe Backer Laird, who is a lawyer with the New York based firm Patterson, Patterson Belknap. Is that correct? Belknap. Belknap. And she is specialized in art law, including working with artists, private collectors, museums, arts organizations, and other um, entities, galleries, dealers, advisors. Um, crucially for us, and financial institutions. Before that, she was for 10 years Senior Vice President and General Counsel of Christie's. Um, she also is um, a former bo board member of Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts and is, I believe, an adjunct professor of art law at Columbia. Um, and then we have our art advisor on the panel. This is Wendy Cromwell. She founded Cromwell Art in 2002. Prior to that, she was vice president of Sotheby's Contemporary Art in New York. She, before that, managed the Shearson Lehman Brothers Contemporary Art Collection and was art collection manager at Chemical Bank, which became Chase Bank, I believe. Um, she is the former president and a current board member of the Association of Professional Art Advisors. And then we have Jill Krause, who um, probably many of you know is a noted contemporary art collector with her husband uh, since 1980, I believe, uh, focusing on contemporary art. Um, she's involved with a number of institutions, including the Museum of Modern Art, and is the board chair of the Public Art Fund. And I believe you're also on the board of the New Museum, is that right? And CalArts, Cal that's right, and CalArts. Um, and so I, I think we should just kind of dive into our topic. I wanna provide a little bit of context um, for this panel. Um, I thought it was an interesting time to think about uh, the ethics of art advising. Um, perhaps some of you saw back in August, the New York Times ran an article about the growth in the advising field. And some, this article was structured around some rather prominent new additions to art advising who had come out of the auction houses um, and were pursuing, a, in some cases, a slightly different model of, of art advising. Anyhow, the article was called, Soaring Art Market Attracts a New Breed of Advisors for Collectors. The authors of the article wrote, quote, the rapidly changing art market, characterized by soaring prices, high fees, and a host of wealthy new buyers from Wall Street and abroad, has prompted scores of new players to jump into the pool, from young art world REVs to former auction house executives with an abundance of expertise and connections. The article went on to say, many art advisors view their, many veteran art advisors view their new competition with concern. Some practitioners are too inexperienced to provide good counsel, they say, or use tactics that they warn threaten to sully the profession, like dealing on the side or demanding brokers' fees from both their clients and the galleries that sell to them. In this article, the um, vice president for um, North and South America at, at Sotheby's, Lisa Dennison um, commented that we're seeing art advisors become more and more acting as negotiators in transactions, which she saw as a somewhat new development. They're more prominent at art fairs and auctions. There's more, this was not in this article, but the, there's more visibility, I think, for art advisors, and I think there's even a reality TV show about art advisors now. So, 
one of the ways that the Times measured the way in which the field has expanded, because it's impossible to get exact numbers, I think, on the number of people who call themselves art advisors, is they looked at the organization that Wendy is involved with, the Association of Professional Art Advisors, which was founded over 20 years ago and now has 140 members. However, the Times pointed out a third of them have joined in the last four years. Is that, I assume that was fact-checked. Um, so we'll hear more about APAA in a moment. But all of this is to say that we're in a time when arguably there are more art advisors than ever before. And they have varying levels of experience and are in some cases wearing more than one hat. So there's, there's an old saying, I, I think, well, relatively old, um, about art advisors, and Wendy won't like this one, but you'll have a chance to respond momentarily, that all you really need in order to be an art advisor is a business card. There's no license required, there's no set qualifications, anyone can go around saying uh, there's an art advisor. So in light of this, I, I think it would be interesting to hear, what do art advisors do? What should they do? What shouldn't they do? What constitutes best practices in art advising? What are some of the things that might lie within what we might call the advisor's responsibilities? So I wanted to start, not surprisingly, with you, Wendy. And if I can just ask the very simple question, what is an art advisor, as you would define it? And, and is it possible for an art advisor to also be an art dealer? So tell us, what is the difference between those two things, and how would you define what an art advisor does? Okay, with pleasure, and I should just say I have no business cards on me, so maybe that, <laughs> <laughs> that has something to do with how I approach my profession. Um, Art advisory is, I would say, 90% educational in terms of practice. I work with collectors um, from an educational vantage point because um, I have 25 years of knowledge, of art historical knowledge, of market knowledge, and I try my best to impart that knowledge to the collectors I work with um, so that they can develop uh, their own knowledge base from which to build an art collection. Um, I guess I would say that might be the art advisor's most prominent job is to educate their client. Um, not every client wants to be educated and that's part of being an art advisor as well and knowing how to navigate a tremendous amount of information and convey that information to a collector um, is another role that an art advisor has. Um, obviously, there's a transactional component to what I do. Um, I help people to acquire art, and in some cases, I help people to edit their art holdings, which means helping them and advising them on selling art. Um, I would say that, um, that was sort of the, the first question was, what does an art advisor do? And the difference between an art advisor and an art dealer is that an art advisor works for their client. Uh, the collector is my primary um, responsibility, and serving my collector is, it's a service business. And I have to say, I was trained by one of the best, I think, Al Taubman, whose collection recently sold at Sotheby's, was really a service provider and really revolutionized, I think, the way art is, is sold and taught me a lot about kind of the service aspect of working in the art business. Um, but an art dealer, their primary obligation is to their artists. They represent artists and it's their job, and Mary will talk about this, to put their artists into important, meaningful art collections that will help their artists to stand the test of time. They also work, art dealers also work with collectors and have a responsibility to a very often loyal collector base who follows the artists they represent. But typically, in the model that the Association of Professional Art Advisors puts forward, Art advisors do not represent artists because it muddies the waters in terms of who your client is. If you are servicing a client who collects art, you can be neutral as an art advisor if you do not represent certain artists. If you choose to represent artists, then of course you will be, you will be obligated to show your client those artists. 
Um, I believe strongly that an art advisor should maintain neutrality and therefore I do not represent any artists nor do I buy and sell works of art on my own account, which dealers do. And that is a very important part of what dealers do. They buy art that they identify as being important to sell to their collectors and they hold on to that work and at some point they sell it. An art advisor, I believe in order to remain impartial and avoid conflicts of interest, should not be buying and selling work on their own behalf. They should be acting as a conduit to their collector, helping them to buy the art. So just following up on that, I, I you know, I copied down the APAA code of ethics here. And um, just for the audience, the, the first item in the APAA's code of ethics is APAA members may not maintain inventory for sale except artwork on consignment on consignment or act as private dealers in any transaction, which is interesting. Some of these other um, co items in the code of ethics have to do precisely with uh, conflict of interest and representing the client. Um, and so I want to just follow up on that. Um, now, I believe you're involved with the um, membership committee at APAA, which art advisors can apply to be members of this organization. And I believe that they need to have a um, letter of recommendation essentially from two art dealers. Um, so, uh, you know, that being the case, I hoped we could turn Mary to you. And, uh, you know, let's say you were um, asked to recommend someone for the APAA. Um, I, I'm wondering what in your, in your you know, practice as, as an art dealer who represents artists, works with collectors, works with, I'm sure, many art advisors, what, how would you define an, an art advisor who is, um, let's say, you know, a good art advisor, that, that is ways of working that are good ways of working, and what are some things that are not so good, or some things that can, can or have gone wrong? What a loaded question. <laughs> um, I just realized I've never ever been asked to recommend an art advisor um, to the organization, which is kind of curious. And as I was listening to your code of ethics at the, um, until last year I was on the executive board of the Art Dealers Association. And we also have a code of ethics which you know sets out different, which, which I think that's, what is very good for both and for, their, for our audience, our constituents, our clients, is that people know there are certain standards that good dealers, good art advisors, you know, look to uphold. And uh, as far as galleries' relationship with art advisors, uh, a good one is someone who brings you an opportunity that you would not have had for your artist. That's the best. Uh, and then manages the transaction with their client from beginning to end in a way that's transparent and ends up in a very positive result. And I have some quite dear friends and colleagues who are art advisors, and it's, it's really... The way it takes a team or a village to raise a family or raise a child, it takes several villages to um, help an artist achieve uh, success. And art advisors can be important to us in terms of finding opportunities or having a network that we, don't, we might not have access to. And I would say when the transaction or the relationship is less successful, it's because it's not clear whose responsibility is who. Um, you know, sometimes I mean, people, art advisors, can play different roles. Some of them are a kind of soup to nuts person for their clients. Uh, some just make the introduction, but it's good for the gallery to know what our role is, what their role is, and um, I think when conflict happens, it's when it's not clear who's supposed to do what or why, um, and then often the client is unhappy, and that's the worst possible result. And so on that note, before I turn to Jill, I want to quickly turn to Joe, who I hoped could tell us a little bit about the, this concept of fiduciary as it applies to relationships like this, because this, this actually is more than even an ethical concept, can sometimes be elevated to a legal 
issue. Well, it's, one, it's one of those places where ethics are really enshrined in the law. Uh, a fiduciary responsibility is, uh, is the highest form of responsibility that one person can have to another. Some people get it by dint of, of their position, their profession. I am a fiduciary for each one of my clients, which means that I always, always have to act in the best interest of the client, not my own best interest and not the best interest of somebody else. Uh, I, cannot work, I cannot work on something that is adverse to the client unless there has been a knowing waiver uh, of that possible adversity uh, or adverseness. Uh, so uh, I think the, the code of ethics that Wendy was talking about really, um, really uh, protects or sets out the, the parameters in which an art advisor can be safe. Some people get it by dint of their office. Some people get it by the nature of the relationship. Uh, and the relationship of some art advisors with their clients will be more close than others. Uh, if, if you are on the end of the spectrum where you are advising somebody who really has no idea what the art market is about, has no idea where thing, how things work, uh, and, and can rely only on you, and only where there's a real, a real disparity of knowledge, you are more likely than not to have a fiduciary responsibility to that client. And whether or not you do, whether you are in a case where if, you, if there were to be litigation, you might be able to prove that, no, 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 they were really experienced and it really wasn't a fiduciary sort of relationship, your client will always claim that it was. Your client will always claim that they were relying solely on you or relying largely on you. So the best thing to do, both from, both from a business point of view and an ethical point of view, is to make sure you're living up to the highest standards, which is only acting in your client's interest at all times. So just quickly, I want to present you with two scenarios, okay? And I, and I was hoping that you and Wendy could respond to these. So in the first scenario, let's say, because I, I think it'd be interesting for our audience to think about how ad art advisors maybe actually work. So let's say I'm an art advisor, and before I was an art advisor, I spent five, seven years as a director at a major gallery. Let's call it Gagosian. And, um, and then, you know, after that, I become an art advisor, and my client is a Mrs. Smith, um, who is a, you know, prominent collector. And I, there's a piece at Gagosian Gallery, happens to be at the place where I used to work. Um, and I'm working on acquiring this for Mrs. Smith. And in the course of this, I get Hey, now I'm on retainer with Mrs. Smith, by the way. I'm being paid a monthly retainer by her, or perhaps an hourly rate. Um, and then I get, a, I get a check in the mail from Gagosian Gallery, and this is a courtesy check for doing business with them. It's maybe not necessarily on the invoice that Mrs. Smith saw. Um, is it okay for me to keep that check? Send it back. Or, but what if, what if I come to Mrs. Well, Smith and I say, I got this check, listen, I, ha I have a okay? real life scenario mm -hmm. if we want to be explicit, and I think we can be, we're among friends. Um, we, as art advisors, um, should not accept any remuneration that the client is not aware of. So instead of sending it back, I might say, I'd like to share this with you, or I'd like to pass this on to you. What are you comfortable with? This can be an additional savings to you, and perhaps because I have this relationship, you'd like to give me a little extra. I mean, it can be a conversation where you don't expose yourself in doing anything wrong, but I mean, a real life situation is there is a gallery, one of the most prominent galleries equal to Gagosian, that will not give any collector a discount. That is their motto and that is their creed and they do not give discounts to anybody. When an art advisor is involved, they give the art advisor a 10% check. Um, I have been in this situation and the first thing I did was say to the client, 
I will give this money to you. This is not my money. This is the discount you should have from the gallery. And then you should think about how you want to compensate me on this transaction. Um, I have had the client say, don't be ridiculous. You earned it. Keep that money. Um, but I, I've also had clients who said, great, I'd like to have that money. And then let's discuss what, you know, what your input was worth. So, so, that's so, the, so the key here is transparency, essentially. The key is totally transparency. Disclosure is a wonderful thing. And when I said give it back, it's a little bit facetious. But in that circumstance where, where you have not, dis presumably you haven't discussed this in advance with your client. I mean, even, even, God forbid, in a contract, an advisory agreement, where you say, look, I will get paid only by you, I, or I, if I receive an introductory commission from a gallery, I will reduce your, uh, the compensation that you're paying. I mean, you can, have, you can arrange all of that in advance. Uh, if somebody comes after the fact uh, and you say, gee, here's a check I just got, uh, do you mind if I keep it? What do you think I, I should do with it? I think that sows distrust in the relationship. These are things that you should speak about up front. And disclosure, uh, disclosure works. I mean, that it, 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 as long as your client is knowledgeable about what the, uh, what the transaction really is, right. I think you're in good shape. And, and just, bef as I said, I had one more little scenario I wanted to present, and then I have some questions for Jill. Let's say, and this is, this, there was actually a, a very prominent lawsuit that had to do with this, but I just want to go into this idea of an, a dealer being in this advisor role. Let's say you have a collector who works very closely with an art dealer who runs a gallery, and that dealer is giving advice to that collector, and they have a friendly relationship. They're friends, even. They do social things together. This collector then acts on the advice of that dealer. Something goes wrong where the dealer appears to be acting in their own interest above that of the collector. The collector says, you know what, I'm suing you. You were my advisor. You gave me advice. You presented yourself as my advisor. Is this something that comes up? Does it, is this why art dealers should not be in this, in this role? You know, it does come up, and there was actually a case against Christie's in that that we won, uh, where somebody came in off the street and, and with a picture or an image of an old master painting, and, and one of the uh, specialists, James Bruce Gardine, a wonderful specialist, uh, said it was by uh, a student of a, a particular old master. Uh, so, uh, and worth maybe making up the numbers, $25,000. Uh, the, the woman actually was looking to see whether a, uh, a, uh, an offer that she had on the painting was a good offer. It was $70,000. She goes back, says fine, and sells the painting to the buyer. Uh, buyer comes to Christie's with the actual painting. And as it turns out, it, it is by the master. And it sold for $200,000. And they came and sued Christie saying, you misled us. There was no, do, there, we talk about where you have a fiduciary responsibility. There was no responsibility between uh, James and the, and the, the, the plaintiff. Uh, because there was no contractual responsibility, there was no fiduciary responsibility, there could not have been any special relationship which would cause a, which could have created a negligence claim. Uh, so there has to be some responsibility. Now it's a little bit different when you have somebody who is your friend and gallery that you work with and, and, and advises, but I still think that that would be, it's a case that can be brought, uh, but I don't think it's a case that would be won. So now I'm, I want to get a different perspective on all of this, turning to Jill. So Jill is an, it is an interesting uh, choice for this panel because she, in fact, has never used an art advisor. Um, and so I want to hear a little bit about, and, but we were talking about this before, what's remarkable is um, in our conversation we had before the panel, she was saying many of her, her collector friends are, are now using advisors um, and that you're maybe in the minority, and I, I was hoping you could you could tell me just a, a little bit, maybe about your your evolution as a collector. You know why you've never chosen to to work with an advisor, and also what you think about sort of being in this in this minority now. 
Well, I'm certainly in the minority. Uh, we, I was talking to another collector friend and a dealer yesterday, and we were trying to come up, make a list of uh, collectors that we knew who didn't, you, didn't either have a uh, advisor or a curator um, on staff, and uh, we filled one hand. <laughs> Uh, which was really scary. I, it was like shocking, actually, to me. Um, you know, we started working, we started collecting in 1980. And, you know, I had finished art school. We had just gotten married. Um, my husband and I, my husband asked me for my birthday, you know, two months after uh, we got married, what I wanted for my birthday. And I said to him, I want a Pierre Alashinsky. And so, um, who is a Cobra School painter. And so we went uh, to the gallery in New York that represented Alashinsky, and we had no money. And we bought an Alashinsky print. And uh, my husband said to the dealer, well, you know, very cocky at 28 years old, you'll call us if you think there's something that we'll, you know, we'd be interested in. And, um, the dealer said to us, no, I'm not going to call you. You'll come back every month, and I'll show you what's new. And um, we went back first every month, then it was every three weeks, and then it was every two weeks, and then it was every week. <laughs> and um, we really spent a lot of time educating ourselves and, um, and looking at art. And what, what I worry about today is that people are buying, with, with art advisors, people are buying with their ears instead of with their eyes. And it's easy to have someone who advises you to um, buy something. And today people are looking at um, art as a commodity, as an investment. And it, it really isn't. Well, you know, I, I, I mean, yes, in some cases it is. But, you know, I bought that Pierre Alashinsky, and, you know, maybe a year later we bought a, a really big drawing of his. And so people used to look at me and say to me, you bought a who? You bought a and what? Now, of course, Cobra's coming Cobra's back. And now Cobra's coming <laughs> and having a resurgence. And, you know, I was at a luncheon not long ago, and this a pers young person who was collecting was sitting next to me. <coughs> and he said to me, well, I'm buying this and I'm buying that. And so, you know, look at what the prices are and look what's gone up and what's gone down. And I said, you know, I guess I've been doing this too long because, you know, I remember the 80s when the market was really the first incredibly frothy collector's market. And, you know, there was this groundbreaking exhibition at the Guggenheim of the Italian painters. And if you like listed off of all of those contemporary painters, I would guess that, you know, if you talk to half of the art advisors today, they wouldn't even know who any of those painters were. Because, and in those days, the work was a fortune for that time period. I mean, you know, a fortune then was $250,000, which was a lot of money for, for contemporary art then. Today, it's not anymore. Today, that's, you know, a throwaway almost. Um, but, you know, I, I worry as a collector that people don't understand that art isn't a commodity. And most, and so many of the advisors today tell people that they're buying something safe, something that's gonna go up in value. And, you know, I would feel with my collection, if I, 20 years from now, or when I die, whatever, you know, that if 20% made it, I would feel like I did really well. And, but I think it's important to point out to, to the audience, because we spoke about this um, earlier, is that Jill and her husband do, are not selling artworks from, from their collection. And um, I, I think it's safe to say that, that among other collectors, selling or editing, if we put it in a somewhat softer way, has become more common. 
Absolutely, um, absolutely. I mean, we decided that this was sort of a history of my husband and I. I mean, we do this together. I mean, he, uh, and he's just walking in. <laughs> and um, we do this together. And, I, you know, I say to him, you know, I've said this to him, he doesn't actually think that he gets very upset when I say this, but I actually think this is sort of the glue in our marriage, that this is something that we do together, that we never buy anything that we don't both agree on. Um, we both have to really love the piece. And, you know, every once in a while, we'll sort of look through the inventory and say, oh, you know, maybe we should look and sell something. And then we look and the only thing we want to sell are things that aren't worth anything anymore. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I mean, we still live with hanging on our wall the first things that we purchased. Yeah. Some of them are by artists that no one has ever heard of since. I mean, we have this little tiny portrait um, that was, that we bought in 1981 by, uh, an artist who represented Spain in the Venice Biennale in 1981. No one's heard of him since then, you know, but we still love uh, that piece. What is his name? Just so we... <laughs> uh, um, you, if you can, uh, if you have it on front I, of I'm mind. Like, now I'm like having a blank Otherwise we can, we can ask you um, afterwards. Sorry, I, like, I'm, bl I'm blanking out. I, I Maybe this blanking. would be a good, a good but moment wanna, for, but, for me to... But yeah, actually I want to, I, not to interrupt you, but I do want to allow Wendy to respond to this because and, and Wendy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, just thinking about when you started your business, you started in 2002. Well, I think yeah. we can talk about, you know, we're maybe in a different time today that is more complex, and and also just with market values changing, this doesn't just affect people who are buying; it affects insurance values. And so I just hoped you could speak to... Well, I'd like to this. speak to what Jill's saying because I, too, have a really long track record, much longer than my business in the art world. And I, when I grew up in Manhattan and I went to the Met, you could whistle down the halls. Uh, nothing was open past 5 o'clock. There were no nights at the Met and nobody was really there. Um, the art world has changed irrevocably since the early 80s and um, it is a it was a smaller place and I think a much friendlier place for collectors a long time ago to be able to navigate and to be able to leisurely visit you know 15 galleries on 57th Street maybe a handful uptown. There was no downtown gallery scene except for, you know, maybe 10 or 15 dealers in Soho. Um, and so the world has really changed and the rise of the art advisor is no different than the rise of the collector, the proliferation of the gallery. Um, everything has gotten bigger. And um, it's true that, I think what Jill says is true that many more collectors buy with their ears. That, that is definitely a, a phenomenon. And it's also true that many people buy art thinking it will go up in value. Um, I, I think that a good art advisor uh, spends a lot of time helping a client to develop their own eye. I do believe that every person has the ability to shape their own eye, even if they know nothing about art when they start looking. And I also believe that um, every collector should meet the gallerist. And I'm very, the way I work is more is more. Everybody should learn as much as they can. In this world, there's access to so much information because of the internet. Um, every, everything I do is there to kind of speed up the process to bring more information um, quicker to a collector or a person who wants to be a collector. Um, but I think that um, inevitably, uh, you know, at some point you, you need to, to begin your collection. And there is, I mean, I've, when I worked at Sotheby's, I left Sotheby's in 2001. And I was there for almost 10 years. And the collections that I had a chance to help edit were some of the great art, private art collections in the world. There was no shame in 
kind of moving on from something that wasn't the focus of the collection anymore, or even the Hirschhorn. Every year, they invite both Sotheby's and Christie's to look at works they'd like to deaccession. You know, museums, too, make choices. In order to help grow their collections, they sell things. Um, and, and certainly, collectors do this as well. So I don't see a negative there, um, and I, and I, at the same time, I do think that a history that you develop with your art is one of the most beautiful things that you can do as a collector. You know, the stories that art tells to you throughout your ownership of it um, and how you came to it are really meaningful. But I, I want to just come back now to, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to you, Mary. Um, what, when you and I were talking, Jill, you told me a story about... Um, a young person you were talking with who said to you, well, I, I got an art history degree and I would be an art advisor, um, and how this was kind of remarkable because that the person thought this was just something they could, this was something they could do directly after having that degree and that that degree was the qualification. Um, and just now before the panel, Joe, you mentioned uh, a concept in, in law that's one of, one of the very basic concepts of, of competence um, and Mary, you and I also talked about this issue of, of qualification. So I know you wanted to respond to this, but I hoped you could also tell me, so when we're talking about art advisors, we come back to this thing of all you need is a business card, but really it's not all you need, right? So ideally, and then I'll have Wendy answer this too, but what, what kind of experience should an advisor have to, to start in this? When, when you were saying that all an advisor needs is a business card that you were quoting, I thought, gee, for parenthood, you don't even need a business card. <laughs> uh, so um, I, think, I think you need years of looking and years of uh, experience in selling art, appraising art, uh, working with people. I think you need highly developed uh, communication skills, both written and verbal. And I think there's nothing that, and an apprenticeship, and it, like you said, you had an apprenticeship with Al Taubman, that that was pivotal. I think you really need to work with, with someone who does it supremely well. Um, if I may just respond a bit when Jill was speaking, uh, a beautiful story about uh, you and Peter. It's, it's, it is a love story. Um, and it's not the first time I've heard that for certain couples, it's a beautiful thing they do together. Um, why the rise of the art advisor? A, I think there's also the question of time and who's collecting now. So in, let's say, between 1900 and 1930, of collectors or people who were high net individuals, something like 10% of them had jobs. And today, of that same group of people, and this is, this is a quote I'm stealing from Mark Spiegler, um, is there is more than 60% of this group of people who are working. They have, they're running businesses, they're running industries, and they're younger, and they have families. Now, I know you and Peter did it when you were raising your family. We used to go with my son in the baby carriage. I mean, he, we, he went everywhere, you know, his first outing in the carriage was to a gallery. So um, we, it's a, it was a family uh, experience. But, but in terms of why people, more people, d despite, in, in addition to the general growth of the field in all ways, I think there is this question of time and that people are used to outsourcing professionally. And that's another kind of outsource. You know, I, I sort of take a little umbrage with that because both my husband and I were working full time. So it's a question of whether you want to spend the time looking versus do you have the time to look. I mean, you know, we will call dealers and say, can we come down at 7 o'clock at night or can we come in early or, you know, I, it, I, I do think that it's it, it's it can be a laziness um, that, or, or not a laziness, a crutch uh, to say that I don't, I don't have the time to do it. Because we were, you know, we had little kids, we both worked full time, we both traveled extensively for our jobs, and, but we made the time 
to, you know, to go and look because it was important to us. But to, just to play devil's advocate here, I, I, I'm assuming you're talking about in the 80s, there probably weren't 500 galleries in Chelsea. No, there weren't 500 galleries. Uh, 200 yeah. on the Lower East Side, and then and the internet. all these art fairs, <laughs> yeah. um, which just because we're in an art fair, and I'm sure there's a lot of people here who, who aren't as familiar with what they see art advisors going around these fairs with their clients. Wendy, can you just tell me a little bit, what, what, what are they doing? What, what are you guys, literally, you're with a client, you're taking them around, <laughs> yeah. well, what's happening there? Well, I'd like to say that there are some art advisors in the audience, including the president of the Association of Professional Art Advisors, and on opening day, opening moment, I saw many of my colleagues um, walking the aisles with their clients. Um, there are more and more people who want to buy art, and an art fair is a daunting prospect. Uh, there is a lot uh, to take in, clearly, and a lot of competition to get the best works. In my day-to-day -day life, I rely on the galleries to help me educate my clients and buy art from them. I do not rely on art fairs. Art fairs are really places where very seasoned collectors who are looking for specific works who can only get them because these days, unfortunately, certain artists produce art for an art fair. The old model of a gallery having an entire show of an artist's work where things are, you know, made, I mean, it just, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, Bryce Martin's show at Matthew Marks this past month was five years of work, all of which had been placed with collectors. So if you want work by certain artists, you have to wait for an art fair. It's kind of a lousy deal, but you have to work with what you're given. So often I'll come to an art fair already having scoped out works by artists that I follow for the collectors who want to buy that art, and I have the works already earmarked. And there are so many art advisors that I feel like I have to go to art fairs in like, I don't know, Georgia or Eastern Europe, I, just to find work that is, I don't have 10 other art advisors trying to buy the same work. So it's very competitive and I'm very limited because I don't have a team that I work with, it's just me and I really value the relationships I have with my collectors. I travel with them for years, I'm their eyes and ears um, and I think that many of the art advisors in the Basel Miami Fair work the same way I do with loyal clients who are looking for specific things. We put them on hold before the fair opens. We go look at them. We do all of our best work two weeks before the fair opens. And the first hour of the fair is kind of it. And then I'm still working. I'm still here working with clients and a number of my colleagues are because not every art collector has that kind of passion or motivation. Some people who want to buy art really just want to stroll around the art fair and look at everything and talk about everything. And that's what today is for. And uh, dealers often change out their gallery selections. And so luckily there's more work that can be done. So I'm going to open it, uh, it up to questions um, in a moment. But, you know, since we are talking about, uh, you know, ethics here, I wanted to just ask you, you know, we talked about this before the panel. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned something that I have always thought is an interesting sort of gray area. And, um, and it, you know, I'm sure you, I, I'm not sure how, you know, you work with a number of clients. At this point, you have clients on different levels in the art market. What if you, one of your clients has, you know, has something, they want to sell it, that another one is something they're looking to, to buy. I think this is a situation where you said you, you would remove yourself in, in that instance. Right. So sometimes you have access to knowledge. You know that a collector of yours owns a piece of art that they might want to sell, and you have another collector that you work with who would like to buy something by that artist, but unfortunately, there is no access to that work. Either the artist isn't having a show for another year, or you have to wait uh, for museums to make all of their purchases before the plebeians can buy art from the gallery. And um, this is a situation that I personally don't like to be in, because I'm not an art dealer, and I don't feel comfortable. I don't know how to charge my clients. Who's the client? <laughs> you have two clients. You don't really want to be paid. It just feels wrong. 
So I recuse myself and I often put the art with an art dealer and I will make money only from the person who buys the art from the art dealer and I let, I let the art dealer make money. Uh, I think it's good for my business to give back to the dealers who help me get access to great works of art and I know that there are other art advisors who would not act. I've spoken with my peers um, actually a peer who's on the association with me who said that she's just transparent and she takes less than she w normally take from each party. I just quickly want to say, I know I've been monopolizing a bit, but art advisors need to be very clear that what they do is a service and they should be paid by, for their service. And there's nothing murky about what we do. We provide a service just like a lawyer or a doctor would to their client. And as long as you're open and transparent with your client and they understand exactly the value of the service you're providing, there is no issue. And what's, what's really important about Wendy was, about what Wendy is saying is that first of all, you have to identify the sorts of things that could create a conflict of interest. Uh, it doesn't always come, come forward with trumpets and, 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 and bright lights. If, if, you, if you as an advisor are going to be getting any kind of a benefit, uh, a benefit of goodwill with somebody else, if you have an interest in a particular artist or piece of work, anything like that needs to be disclosed. Uh, and, and with disclosure, uh, I think you can engage in the business. Uh, Wendy's approach was simply saying, look, there's a conflict. I'm not going to engage in this. I'm, I'm not going to engage in the transaction. There are two different approaches, both of which are totally viable legally. Mary, you had one more thing. One, one more. I wanted to ask Jill, if I were 30 years younger and starting to collect, what would you advise me to do? You know, I, I literally just had a conversation with a young woman that works for my husband who um, took me to lunch and said, okay, I'm 28 years old. How do I do this? I really love art. And I, you know, I said to her the same thing that John Lefebvre said to me, you know, in 1980, which was buy something you love. Don't buy it because someone told you it's an investment. Buy it because if it doesn't go up in value, you love living with it. And I said to her, you know, now, I don't know if this works this way anymore, but in 1980, we had no money, so when we bought art, we had $500 worth of expendable income every month. And so every month we paid off whatever we were buying at $500 a month. And then when we finished buying that, we bought something else. And, um, and I asked, you know, I, I thought about that for this, you know, because uh, I knew I was going to be here today. So I asked a dealer um, who I really like. And I said, you know, would you do that? And she said, if I have, so if there's an, a, a, someone who comes into the gallery and is constantly coming in and constantly asking questions and then says to me, I really love this work, but it'll take me a year to pay it off. I said, would you let her do it? And she said, absolutely. So I think that, I mean, for me, that's the, that's the most important thing. I, I think that art advisors have a place. And I think there are re some really great art advisors who have built astonishing collections for people. So I, it's not that I don't think that there's a place in the art world for art advisors. I worry that everyone is an art advisor you know, that we get back to where you started with this conversation, is that there's no, there's, you know, if you're an art advisor and you've worked 10 years as, you know, for a gallery, and then you've um, spent, you know, you've had a gallery of your own, or you worked for an auction house for a number of years, and you really know, and you can offer something to your client. I mean, I don't understand people who get out of school and think they can be an art advisor and that they have access to anything. Like, um, we had this conversation on the telephone where I said someone called me and said, I graduated from Bard and I want to be an art advisor. How do I, do, you know, what do I do? And I was like, 
oh my God, that's a profession that you come out of art school, you know, out of college thinking that you want to have? I, it was, but, I, I was but I shocked. Think, but I, I, I think maybe what Wendy is saying is, in fact, no. Right. You know, no, no, no. But, not, but that's, so. I mean, so I think that, you know, I, I think the, the proliferation of advisors is something, you know, people who don't understand the business side of it, don't, un, you know, all of those kinds of things. I'm just not sure why people would hire those people. I mean, and that's yet, the other thing. And yet, you know? and yet apparently they do. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'd want to, we have time for, for maybe, unfortunately, one question because we've, right we've used up our time. So let's, this gentleman yeah. here. You had commented on the fact that people might come to you, Wendy, and we're looking for a certain work, a certain genre of work, a certain artist, help us find it, help us negotiate it. How do you handle a situation when someone comes to you and says, you know, I, I have dollars in my pocket, I, I'd love to be surrounded by art, I have a couple pieces, but I'm really not quite sure really what I want to do, what I want to be surrounded with. How do you, how do you go about counseling them? Because I think that's a higher burden that well, you would have. Well, I, I love that kind of client, actually because they really are hiring me for my knowledge. And I spend time imparting knowledge. We literally go to museum exhibitions together. We do not start in a commercial setting. Uh, we read things that are helpful to identify different movements in art, different areas of art that could be interesting. We talk about what these things cost so that people have a knowledge base for informed decision making. I mean, I had somebody who came to me and said, I love Richard Diebenkorn, and I have $50,000, and I only can buy one thing. Can you help me? And I said, well, there's only one Richard Diebenkorn, and you can never have that work at this point. Even a print costs more than $50,000. Well, you can get a small print, black and white. <laughs> I said, let me help you look at younger artists who are inspired by or who work in a, in a trajectory that comes out of Diebenkorn. And we bought, this was maybe seven years ago, a painting by Amy Silman, who at the time, I think it was about $35,000, so I saved him some money. And now that painting, you know, is, I don't have access to that work anymore because her market has taken off to the point where only museums and museum trustees get to buy that work. So, you know, I'm, I love that kind of client. <laughs> we have one more question in the, in the front row here. Thank you. Um, I also want to specify that maybe working with an art advisor for, to look at things like condition reports and whether the title is clear and liability issues. Um, I don't know what kind of liability insurance you all carry. I know appraisers carry hefty liability insurance. So that whole other legal side, I think, is a, why an art advisor would be useful to me on, on major purchases, maybe not the small purchases. But I think, it, could you speak to that quickly? Um, absolutely. I think that um, anyone who holds themselves out as a fiduciary in a role where they're advising a client needs to do the best work. They, what is ethics? It's doing good work. Um, so to do good work, especially if you're dealing with an artist who's deceased or if it's a piece of art that l survived through World War II, you know, doing the due diligence to understand the provenance of the work and, and, I mean, I get Joe involved when I'm doing something that I feel I need to do deeper research and have more security in order to correctly advise the client. I, I think it's really important, even when you're buying work by a young artist, to understand the condition issues. I mean, you know, if you buy tennis ball fuzz, which is something Tom Friedman sold at one point, a well-known artist, you have to understand what ownership of that work entails. Um, so condition issues are key in contemporary art. Um, and title, clear title, I mean, there are many, there are many issues. Uh, there are many dark and twisty corners when you start dealing with earlier art. And it's important to know, have a trusted network of legal counsel, conservators who specialize in certain areas of art and have that arsenal at your disposal. So when you are hired by a collector, you come with a team of trusted experts that you can turn to. Okay, well, I think any longer and they'll have to pay you. Oh.
<laughs> All right, I think we're, we're, thank you everyone for coming. I think we scratched the surface at least.